Hello, I am Jolie Long with the National Board for Certified Counselors. On behalf of the Medicare Mental Health Workforce Coalition, we would like to welcome you to our webinar today. Before we begin, I would like to share some meeting details. Closed captions are now enabled and attendees can turn these on and off as desired. Interpreters can join the meeting via the phone number, ID, and passcode on this slide. A link to this PowerPoint presentation will be posted in the chat, so you can access the links on this slide. To receive continuing education credit, you must complete the session evaluation. It will be posted in the chat at the conclusion of the webinar. We will also send you an email with a link to the survey following the webinar. We will only be providing credit for the live attendance of this webinar. This webinar will be recorded and made available on the NBCC website and other coalition member websites for viewing purposes only. Due to the large number of attendees, the participants will remain in listen-only mode throughout the meeting. The presenters will be taking questions at the end of the session, so please feel free to type your questions in the Q&A box at any time. The Medicare Mental Health Workforce Coalition consists of organizations that collectively represent providers, clients, patients, and other stakeholders. Our overall mission is to increase access to client choice for mental health provider care. Together, we achieve this goal with the passage of the Mental Health Access Improvement Act. The coalition is now working to ensure successful integration of counselors and marriage and family therapists into the Medicare program. The coalition members are listed on this slide. Today, you will hear from a panel of experts on the key implementation features of Medicare Part B coverage of counselors and MFTs with implications for providers so you can best prepare before the proposed Medicare program regulatory process and rules scheduled for public comment in July. Speakers will review the major steps and actions that counselors and MFTs will need to take to enroll in the traditional Medicare fee-for-service program, Parts A and B, prior to January 1, 2024. Identify the actions that providers will need to take to engage Medicare Advantage Part C behavioral health insurance plans to secure participation on individual networks and panels. Describe in detail key components of the Medicare physician fee schedule, how reimbursement rates are determined, and implications for practitioners. Respond to questions about enrollment issues, the release of the Medicare physician fee schedule, and potential next steps in the implementation of Medicare Part B coverage of counselors and MFTs. I would now like to welcome NBCC and Affiliates Board Chair, Mona Lisa McGee Barada, to provide opening remarks and to introduce our first speaker. Good afternoon. On behalf of NBCC and the Medicare Mental Health Workforce Coalition, I'd like to welcome you to part three of this webinar series focused on preparing counselors and MFTs to participate in the Medicare program. The intention of this series and coalition is to educate, prepare, and to keep you informed of the steps to integrate our practitioners into the Medicare program in the most effective and efficient way possible. The coalition partners continue to work closely with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services and intend to provide ongoing information to support you during the implementation phase of this process. We know the inclusion of counselors and marriage and family therapists will have a significant and lasting impact on mental health of Medicare recipients and their families. If you attended the previous webinars, we're glad you're back and we welcome all first time attendees as well. This is a unifying time in our profession and we look forward to easing the workforce shortages across the nation and increasing access to quality mental health care for all populations. In addition to the collaborative work of the coalition, I wanna thank the NBCC team for their role in hosting this webinar. I would also like to thank Dr. Kylie Dodson-Blake, NBCC CEO, for her steadfast advocacy for the counseling profession. 
I would now like to introduce you to our first speaker. Gina Mandala serves as the business function lead with the Provider Enrollment and Oversight Group in the Center for Program Integrity at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS. She is responsible for providing operations and policy guidance related to Medicare provider enrollment. She works with multiple Medicare administrative contractors, including Noridian Healthcare Solutions, First Coast Service Options, Inc., and Novitas Solutions, Inc. She also works with the National Site Visit Contractors, Deloitte SVS West PMO, and Palmetto GBA. Prior to joining CMS in 2019, she uh, was a social worker, and she has over 10 years of experience in the healthcare field. She received both a Bachelor of Arts in Community Mental Health with a minor in counseling and a Master of Social Work from the University at Buffalo. I now invite Joy Alafio of the California Association of Marriage and Family Therapists to introduce our next speaker. Thank you for that, Mona Lisa. Uh, and good day, everyone. And thank you for joining us. My name is Joy Alafia, and I am the Executive Director for the California Association of Marriage and Family Therapists. We are elated that MFTs and counselors will be able to provide quality mental health care starting January 1st, 2024 to the Medicare community. I have the pleasure of introducing our second speaker today, who will share, share information to help you navigate the process of becoming a Medicare provider. Jeannie Vance is a healthcare transaction and regulatory attorney who is a partner with the Sacramento-based law firm Weintraub Tobin. Jeannie has expertise in Medicare and Medicaid payment and enrollment matters, healthcare operations, and healthcare mergers. Jeannie advises healthcare professional groups and associations regarding healthcare licensing and payment requirements for compliant business structures. She also advises on ongoing healthcare compliance obligations as a condition of participating in government payment programs. Jeannie is currently the chair of the Regulation, Accreditation, and Payment Practice Group of the American Health Law Association and was previously the president of the Sacramento Health Law Committee and the vice chair of the California State Bar Health Law Committee. Jeannie received her degree from the University of California Law, San Francisco, and her undergraduate degree from Mills College. We have two knowledgeable speakers for you today, and I will now turn it over to our first presenter. Welcome, Jeannie Mendola, to begin. Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is, you know, is Gina Mendola, and I am here to present on getting enrolled into Medicare. So what we're going to be covering in these slides is really introducing Medicare, the basics of it, how you're going to enroll, what applications are, and when to enroll. So what is Medicare? Medicare is a federal health insurance program that is for anyone that is 65 years or older, younger people with disabilities, and then people of any age that have end-stage renal disease. So there are various different parts of Medicare. I'm going to be focusing on Part B since this is what we'll be applying to you all. Part B covers doctor visits, outpatient care, medical supplies, and preventive services. Um, which specifically are for physicians and non-physicians and clinical groups. Um, the rest of these provider types won't necessarily apply to you. So Medicare wanted to welcome mental health counselors and marriage and family therapists. According to the Consolidations Appropriation Act of 2023, we now are going to be accepting enrollments for mental health counselors and marriage and family therapists when you will not be able to start enrolling just yet though we are requesting that you wait until the calendar year 2024 physician fee schedule which is posted in the federal register does come out please note when you're applying the earliest effective date that you can start billing is january 1st of 2024 and then there are 
certain requirements that are requested in order to qualify. You will need a master's or doctor's degree. Um, you will also need to be licensed and or certified in whichever state you are providing your services. You will need two years of clinical supervision and any other requirements that are set by the secretary. In regards to payment, you will be receiving 80% of the lesser of the actual charge of the service or 75% of the amount determined for payment of a psychologist. So now we're going to, con to go over what a Medicare administrative contractor is, a MAC. They are one of the best resources that you can use. This is a private health insurer that is awarded to a specific geographic location. They will cover um, enrolling providers in to the program, they'll cover your claims, responding to inquiries, and educate you about your billing requirements. So this is a map of all of our jurisdictions and our contractors associated. You will note there are 12 different contractors which are throughout the state. Now we're gonna get into more details on how to actually enroll into the program. So this is our golden rule. These are all the policies that we go by in provider enrollment. Um, if we ever have any questions or if you ever have any questions, these will be what we are quoting in any responses that we reply to. So now I'm going to go through a brief summary of the entire enrollment process. This will be broken down within the next few slides. So the first step, is really that you wanna get your mindset and you need to apply for an MCI. Um, and then once you have that MCI, you're going to take a look at the application. You're gonna fill that out. Now, if you're filling out a paper application, you're going to submit that to your MAC, which is, as I referenced earlier, your best point of contact here. Once you submit that, the MAC is going, they have up to 30 days to process that application. They're going to go through the intake process, Go through the screening and verification process. Then you're going to scroll your eyes down to four, where you're going to go through the pre screening, verification, the risk categories. If unfortunately you are stuck at number five, that means that development was needed in your application. Um, they will reach out to you, and then hopefully, after development process, we're going to finalize and get the claim system updated and hopefully approve of your application. So if you're not submitting an app, a paper application, then you will be submitting an application online. Again, you're just gonna go through steps one. You fill out the application. Two is direct, it's taken out of the system since you're directly inputting all of your information into Pecos. Then down to four, you're gonna go through the pre-screening verification. Hopefully step five for development isn't needed at that point and we roll into step six which is where we're finalizing your enrollment and getting you improved. So what everyone needs to think of is the Identity Access and Management System. INA is a program that as soon as you create your information in INA, you're gonna have access to our National Plan and Provider Enumeration System, which is NPES, also known as the location in which you create your NPI your provider enrollment chain and ownership system, PAGOS, where we're gonna go to enroll, we validate, and report any changes within your enrollment. And then your electronic health reg record, which is where you register for your EHR incentive payment. So I also wanna make a note on this slide that as soon as you, at, you create your user and password for INA, then you can get started in this process. There is no need to wait for anything further um, to come to. You. All right, so when you're creating your NPI, your National Provider Identifier, some of you may already have an NPI if you're currently billing. Others of you may need to do this. So there are two different types of NPIs. The first one are for your individual providers and or non-physician practitioners. And the second type is for any type of organization. So essentially, if you're not an individual practitioner, you're gonna need to apply for a type two NPI. Um, over into the middle of the slide, we have two, 
three, I'm sorry, three different ways in which one can gain an NPI. You can go online into NPES, you can submit a paper application, or if you are with a large group, maybe they'll do it for you through an EFI, the electronic file interchange. And at the bottom of the slide, you will see that we did provide a link for you if you're unaware of where and the link for NPES. All right, so when you're thinking of signing up for an MCI, Medicare wanted to make you aware of the point of the taxonomy code versus the point of the specialty type. So taxonomy codes are used when you're applying for your MCI. The importance of a taxonomy code is to make sure that you are properly getting paid in Medicare. There's a different rate for everything, so we really urge you to focus on that taxonomy code. Um, another thing to be aware of is that when you are applying for your NCI, there is no screening involved. That is completely different than the Medicare screening that we do. In addition to the taxonomy code, one should be aware of the specialty types that we have in Medicare. So the specialty types for um, the mental health counselors and the marriage and family therapists they're abbreviated as MHC and MFT. Those are currently not on our applications. Our applications are only able to be updated every three years. So we're not currently at the point of updating our applications. So when you are applying for Medicare, we request that under the specialty type, you just select other and then you can write out the specialty type that you are. Um, and of course, the specialty type in Medicare also depends on how you are paid. Since the taxonomy codes are so important, Medicare has created the link that you see in this slide, which is updated on a quarterly basis to help you get aligned with the correct taxonomy code. On this slide, you're gonna see different types of applications that one can apply to. These are all specifically related to our mental health counselors and our marriage and family therapists. Please do not be confused. There are more applications than this. We just found it important to go over what is relevant to our provider types for this presentation. So an 855i is, sorry, a CMS 855i. This is an in application for individual practitioners and non-physician practitioners. Um, so any individual practitioner, you literally need to use this in order to enroll. Then our CMS 855R is where reassignments um, occur. So you will need this if there's an individual that wants to work for multiple organizations. You're gonna have to actually submit an 855I along with an 855R. Those are two applications that you'll need to submit. And then in completely different terms, there is a CMS 855B. If you are an owner of a facility and like a clinic group, and you want to enroll your practice into Medicare, then you will be submitting an 855B. So who can sign the enrollment application? I think that before we even get into the details of the slide, it's very important that people know what an authorized official and a delegated official is. So an authorized official is anyone with ownership or control interest. This is someone that's generally an owner of the facility um, or someone like a chairman, a CEO, CFO, People with that type of title are generally who are the, the authorized officials. Please note that their signature is legally and financially binding in Medicare. Then in relation, there's also a delegated official. This is whomever the authorized official delegates to be a delegated official. Um, they are, their signature is also legally and financially binding. So when you are signing these applications, if you're submitting an 855-I, which is your individual application, the individual provider will need to sign that. So if you are 
an individual provider, you're submitting your 855-I, and then you're also submitting a reassignment, which is your 855-R, you will need to sign it. And plus, wherever you're being reassigned to, that group, an AO or a DO, will also need to sign that. So that's two signatures on your 855-R. And then in changing that up, if you are terminating um, a reassignment or changing a reassignment, let's say you are an individual provider and you decide, I no longer want to work for XYZ practice, then you will need to submit an 855R and you, will, you, the individual practitioner, will need to sign that along with, I'm oh, sorry, you, the individual practitioner, will need to sign that or your organization will need to sign that. So there are various different types of reasons when you're going to be submitting an application. We go through a, a few general ones here for initial app, um, an initial application when you want to enroll into Medicare. If there is a change of information um, upon revalidation, upon reactivation, and a voluntary withdrawal. The next few slides will go through these different types of applications. So this slide covers our electronic funds transfer agreement, our EFT. All providers must receive Medicare payments through an EFT. So this is very important. Um, when you're submitting your EFT agreement, you'll either need to submit a voided check or receive a bank letter verifying your account information. Um, the other portion of this is that once our MAC are reviewing your EFT, they need to confirm that information either with an authorized official, a delegated official, or a contact person. That point is very important because sometimes, unfortunately, our MACs can't get a hold of an AODO or a contact person, and then the EFT doesn't actually change. Um, so just be aware of who who is on your application. Um, and then, of course, if providers who are reassigning all of their benefits to one group, they don't need to submit an EFT. All right, now we're going to get into pre-screening um, verification and how we process the application. So this talks about the screening and Medicare I don't want many people to be worried about this because I believe you guys all are great providers. So on face value, if you are just a provider who has a degree and we'll just state it at that, nothing additional in your background has changed, then you are generally going to be at the limited risk. Um, this is where we're gonna do some verification and database checks. Um, if you're looking at the moderate, the moderate, the higher that you go up in, on that ladder, you're going to have all the below steps that are added to the screening category. So for moderate, um, this is like your ambulances, independent um, diagnostic testing facilities, facilities of that nature, they're going to be moderate risk. So of course, they're going to have all of the license and database checks in addition to a site visit. And then going one step higher, our highest category is a high-risk provider. So these are newly enrolling home health agencies and our durable medical equipment, prosthetics, orthopedics, and suppliers, which are at the high. This means that they do go through fingerprints, they go through site visits, and then they also go through all of their license and database checks. So. If you are high risk, this means that one of the following situations would have occurred. So you were excluded from Medicare or a federal health care program. You were terminated from Medicaid. Um, you applied to Medicare within six months after a temporary moratorium or within the last 10 years, one of the following happened. So you had a Medicare payment suspension. Medicare was Billing, your Medicare billing privileges were revoked, or you had a final adverse legal action. So please note, if you didn't have any of those things happen to you, 
then you are likely on the limited screening category. So let's get into delays. Unfortunately, about 30 to 35% of our applications that we receive are delayed. And delays are, there are a variety of reasons why there are delays. And the math will go back to the contact um, for additional information. So like we already talked about, our EFT agreements, not having a voided check or a bank letter, um, education documentation. It's very important that um, for your degree, you are sharing a copy of your degree. Share copies of those certificates. And definitely we need documentation supporting your supervision that you have met in the requirements for supervision. Um, if certain states, do require like additional qualifications in order to get licensed. And if supervision is a requirement in order to get licensed, you still need to expand on that when you're enrolling in Medicare because our regulations and our um, qualifications are different than the state. So we really just want to make sure that you understand we need all of those education documents like directly laid out for us. Um, anyways, so missing fields, a lot of times there unfortunately are sometimes blank, blank um, in applications. We need to send that back if there's wrong signatures, incorrect information, all of those reasons and more, of course. Um, so when there is missing information, our MACs are going to reach out with a request for additional information. They're going to contact a few different people either the contact person, the individual provider, or an authorized or delegated official. Um, as you can see, we, they reach out to you in various different ways. You will have 30 days to respond. If you don't respond, there are going to be delays in your applications. You may receive a later effective date and your application may possibly be rejected. So let's talk about being approved. Enrolling provider, once you are approved, um, Medicare has determined that you do meet our requirements and um, you meet the rules and regulations to have a billing number. So providers are never approved until we have completely updated all of our systems. And this includes the claim system, which generally takes one to two days. Um, and then your approval letter is always sent to the contact person. If there's not a contact person on your application, then the letter is sent to the correspondence address. So it's really important that you make sure that the contact person is always updated as well as your correspondence address because the contact person has a great deal of responsibility in you getting paid. So, how does Medicare figure out the effective date? We actually get this question quite a bit. So the effective date is always going to be the latter of either when the application is received or the first date of services at a new location. So um, say you are working with a group and they're really on top of things, which is excellent. They submit their application on April 1st. Um, the MAC then approves the application and on that application, you requested an earlier effective date for the providers that are working under your facility. And so as long as you did that within 30 days, sorry, you can apply up to 60 days earlier, then your effective date will be granted of June 1st. However, as we all know, sometimes we get busy and um, we fall a little bit behind, well, not to fear. You can submit your application and we can backdate providers working for your facility back to 30 days. Um, so in this example, the provider performs services, they start that on June 1st. We receive the application on July 1st, and then the MAC approves the application September 1st, but we, pro we allow the effective date of June 1st for the provider. Um, it is important to know if it's not gathered from this slide, that when you are applying to Medicare, you need to be 
very careful about your effective dates that you're entering in there. Um, if the effective dates are outside essentially of when you submitted the application and you're requesting a much earlier or a much later effective date, the MAC will be reaching out to you. What is a PTN? A PTN is in Medicare, only Medicare uses PTNs, and we use this as a way to help everyone get billed. So it's an authentication to providers when interacting with our interactive voice response, which is a phone system, um, our internet portal or online application status. Um, we request that you don't share your PTN um, as that is a hazard to get hacked. Um, and the NPI must be used when you are billing the Medicare program. Physician and non-physician PTNs. So individuals are assigned PTNs based on their private practice, their group's affiliations, and so forth. So if you are an individual provider, you will be receiving one PTN. If you are reassigning yourself to a group, then you will receive a second PTN. Just, and that's just strictly so that we can follow where your billing is going. Um, if you are a sole owner, you will have one PTN, and if you are also practicing, you will have another PTN. Um, so you have one PTN for the group and one PTN for yourself. Group and supplier PTNs. So PTNs are assigned per EIN per state. You may ask, what is an EIN? So essentially, your EIN is either your social security number, if you're an individual provider or a sole owner, or your EIN is going to be a TIN number that you get from IRS if you are a group. Um, so existing providers will require new PTNs if they're asked adding a new location in a different payment locality within the same state. So something that a lot of people aren't aware of is that um, the new locality within the different state, this actually applies to California. Between Northern California and Southern California, you will receive different PTNs um, based on your practice location. Um, and then enrolling in different provider types, that's when you receive a new PTN, or if you're a hospital, um, based on your different departments, you receive different PTNs, but that won't, will not apply to you. Now we're going to talk about other submission types. So what, when would you submit? submit a change of information. So you're changing your practice location, correspondence information, um, your ownership, your contact person, all times when you submit a change of information. So changes of information for ownership, um, authorized delegated officials, um, adverse legal action, and practice locations, those all need to be submitted within 30 days. Um, within 90 days is any other information. Revalidation. So revalidation will occur for individual providers and your group. Um, so again, submitting your 855Is and your 855Bs, you'll need to submit new applications every five years and sorry not new but a revalidation application and essentially your revalidation application is just going to confirm that everything that we have on file is accurate um, so if you are submitting a revalidation application and you only submit one you only say that you're working out of one practice location instead of all of the practice locations on your initial application then the MAC is going to say, okay, now you no longer work at any of those other locations, so we're going to end date all of those. So please be careful when you're revalidating, revalidating your application. And then these are all of the resources that we have for provider enrollment assistance. And of course, there are always your MAC, um, and these slides will be shared with everyone after the presentation, I believe.
Thank you so much for that presentation and for all of that very detailed information, Gina. We really appreciate that. Um, we're actually not going to take questions just yet. We're going to take them at the end of the presentation. Uh, we are collecting them. I know that a lot of people have questions and they're putting them in the Q&A box. So thank you for doing that. Um, I would now like to go ahead and invite Jeannie Vance to give her presentation on the fee schedule. And then um, with the time that we have left, we will um, get to as many questions as possible. So welcome, Jeannie. We're ready for you to begin. Thank you so much, Jolie, and I really appreciate um, you inviting me to participate in this webinar. It's really exciting to be um, participating in um, helping uh, MFTs and counselors um, be able to get Medicare payment for the first time. It's really an exciting you know, opportunity for me as a health law professional. So I'm going to be talking about uh, providing an overview of the Medicare physician fee schedule, um, which will give you sort of a high level um, a high level overview of how Medicare rates get calculated, how you can find out what they are, um, and then you know what comes out each year in the Medicare physician fee schedule. And so you'll have that information and decide how much into the weeds you want to get in the future. So the Medicare physician fee schedule is a big rule that is published each year in CMS. Uh, it, it's usually published in July of each year. We are uh, anxiously awaiting the one for uh, 2025, or excuse me, 2024, because um, we know that it will have new rules um, to implement uh, payment provisions relating to our practitioners here. Uh, once it's published in the Federal Register, uh, constituents have a period of time where they can submit comments. And so, and anyone could submit a comment. Anyone that's on this call, me, associations, you know, state governments will sometimes submit comments. Um, and that really is a very good chance for you to let CMS know how something impacts you, and they will consider it. Um, and they'll let you know when um, they come around when the final rule is published, which generally happens about November 1st, that they've considered your um, comment and they um, will respond to it either, you know, favorably or, you know, unfavorably. Um, and they'll tell you why. Um, so then those rules are effective in January 1st of uh after the final rule is published. So you, you have about 30 days to submit those comments. The Medicare Physician Fee Schedule has the force of law. Um, it's, there's notice and comment and then it's adopted. The Medicare Physician Fee Schedule, it's hundreds of pages of very fine print. Um, usually what I do is I look at, there's a table of contents with subject headings. Um, to sort of scroll through and see what topics are covered um, to see which ones I want to engage with. Uh, and there, and then also in the Medicare Physician Fee Schedule update are updates to the actual um, rates that are paid uh, under the fee-for-service program um, for physicians and other healthcare practitioners. And of course, what we are concerned with here are marriage and family therapists and counselors. In addition, the Medicare Physician Fee Schedule will update the rule, update rules that apply to Medicare Part B suppliers, which is what you all will be. Um, and each year it's a bit different. There'll be implementation of new laws and then updates to payment policies. Key information um, for those that are in advocacy positions or uh, maybe will ha have comments after the rules are adopted is that you can get right there in the Federal Register contact information at CMS for people who are responsible for the substantive issues within the Medicare physician fee schedule. And so what it'll say is, for example, you know, Medicare enrollment, that's a topic that frequently gets changed in the Medicare physician fee schedule. Here's your CMS person that's responsible for that part. And here's how you can get a hold of him or her. Usually it's Frank Whalen, so it would be him there. And then it'll give you information about how long the comment period and what the deadline is, and then the manner of submission um, for your any comments that you might have. 
The physician fee schedule is the methodology that's used for reimbursing practitioners for services in all kinds of settings, whether it's a private practice to a hospital, skilled nursing facility, um, telehealth, et cetera. The fee schedule amount is expressed in dollars, and it also sets forth the maximums for payment under, uh, under Medicare for both physicians and other practitioners. Next slide, please. So there will be two uh, potential rates that are applicable to uh, uh, practitioner services. Um, one would be uh, there's a professional rate and then there's a professional rate if services are provided in a facility. And the reason is because uh, when you're providing a service in your own office, you're providing all of the uh, expense that's required to provide a service. So that includes your office space, utilities, um, malpractice insurance, the actual person providing the services, et cetera. Um, and then there's a second rate that is a little bit lower that's provided when the professional services are provided in a quote unquote facility, which, you know, the most obvious example of that is in a hospital. So if you know, you're a MFT and you're providing a service in the hospital, the hospital's providing the building and the utilities and things like that. And they actually can get a little bit of a facility fee that they would bill for separately from you. And then you get a little bit lower of a professional fee. All right, so here is the Medicare physician fee schedule formula. And I am going to go into what each of these things are, but this is how Medicare calculates the payment. <clears throat> so, and this formula doesn't change. It's the same. What happens is the values assigned to each one of these little, um, you know, uh, <laughs> alphabet soup that we have here, um, those change and those change in the physician fee schedule each year. So um, I will tell you what, what, what the words, what these acronyms mean. And then I have some slides that breaks down what each, what each of these things means. Um, so the payment is calculated by adding up a variety of things. So we have the work relative value units multiplied by the work geographic practice cost index added to the practice expense relative value units and the malpractice the practice expense, uh, we're going to just abbreviate it to Gypsy now, then you'll really, you know, impress everyone with that geographic practice cost index, plus the malpractice relative value units and the malpractice Gypsy multiplied by the conversion factor. So what do each of those mean? So relative value units, um, and you'll see those if you actually look at the Medicare physician fee schedule, you'll see these expressed um, in tables, the work RVU shows the Medicare physician fee schedule services relative um, time and intensity. Those are really important, and they also express sort of policy um, decisions made in Medicare payments. So at one time, there was a big reallocation of waiting to provide higher weights to, um, you know, primary care physicians and less to, you know, specialists. And that was a policy decision um, by CMS. Uh, and work RVUs, it's a very respected way to um, determine how much people are working or how hard it is um, and the effort and intensity. And so there are plenty of private payers or even employers that may compensate employees based on these Medicare um, work RVUs because uh, it's a way to incentivize productivity. So some of you may have some experience with work RVUs um, in the private setting because they borrow from CMS. Uh, the practice expense RVU shows the costs of supporting a practice. So, you know, office rent, staff costs, et cetera. And then the malpractice RVU shows the cost of malpractice insurance. And so there's a value that's assigned to that. <clears throat> Then you have each of those uh, relative value units modified for where you are in the country and the relative cost of living um, that takes place here. So, um, you know, our high cost of living, I'm in California, so, you know, we're going to be, um, you know, have one of the higher inflators um, for geographic 
practice cost indices um, and then someplace where it might be cheaper to, pr to provide services, um, cheaper standard of living than um, the gypsy um, factor would be lower. And then there's a conversion factor that's expressed in dollars. Um, there's a formula that uh, is in the Social Security Act that CMS uses to update that each year. And then, you know, that you multiply to come up with the Medicare rate. So the fee schedule amount, it includes the, the patient copay. So one of the requirements under the Medicare program is that practitioners are required to collect the copay from the patient. So Medicare will generally pay 80% of the allowed amount, and then you're required to collect the 20% from the um, beneficiary. There is a really uh, terrific tool that's available on the CMS website called the Physician Fee Schedule Lookup Tool. I've given you the link right there and you can, um, you know, let's just say, you know, your top five codes in your personal practice. You can um, go on there and, um, you know, run those codes and then see what comes up uh, under the tool. And I'm going to give you a few examples of what that looks like. So. All right, so I put in there a common um, code for services delivered by MFTs and counselors, 90837. That's a 60-minute um, psychotherapy session. And you'll see um, there's a MAC locality. So that is going to be a geographic area. And what you have in there is you have an actual um, non-facility price and a facility price, because remember I told you there were those two different amounts. Um, and then uh, there's, there's also a limiting charge in there, which is if you are not going to be billing the Medicare program directly and you're billing the patient um, and they have to submit their own Medicare claims, there's a limit. So that's what that means. And then you see that conversion factor down there at the on the far right column. And that's that 33.8872. Um, so that that's what it is. And that's the same for every um, geographic area. And then if you want to back into the formula and what the relative values are, here's that same code. And you'll see uh, the work RVU amount that's there. You'll see um, some different iterations of the practice expense RVU there, and then the malpractice RVU. And so those values can be used to um, sort of understand. And then, you know, the other thing is if you're negotiating with health plans in terms of um, using some of these same concepts in terms of uh, the reimbursement, it's helpful to know a little bit about how this formula works. Um, you know, and aside about this, um, this uh, the Medicare physician fee schedule, this uh, is used for people, a uh, patient will be either a traditional Medicare patient or they will be a Medicare Advantage patient. And so the difference is the Medicare Advantage patients have elected to have their coverage provided in a managed care plan. So this Medicare physician fee schedule is going to apply for those patients who are in the traditional Medicare program. If you want to receive reimbursement from a Medicare Advantage plan, you need to first enroll, as Gina talked about in our first session, in the Medicare fee for service program, and then you can go contract with the health plan, for, uh, the Medicare Advantage health plans, just like you would any other regular health plan. The Medicare physician fee schedule has is is an there's an annual update, and, and as I mentioned, the formula itself does not change, but the values that are assigned under the physician fee schedule do change each year that they, CMS corrects issues such as misvalued um, codes. It will reweight codes between specialties, um, sometimes to account for, you know, shortages and uh, policy, you know, values, that kind of thing. Um, and so each year it's a bit different. <clears throat> and then the policy uh, matters and the regulatory updates that come out each year in the physician ske fee schedule. Sometimes we know what those are ahead of time. So, for example, we know that the MFT and counselor um, Medicare, the regulations for 
implementing the payment part of that will be in this year's physician fee schedule. But there'll be lots of topics that I have no idea that are coming out. So, and and many of those will could directly or indirectly affect you and the way that you engage with the Medicare program. Um, and I'll give some examples of that in a moment. Um, CMS cannot change the Social Security Act, the statute, but it can provide additional clarifications or interpretations on statutory requirements. And so they will modify regulations in the physician fee schedule. So here are a few examples of policy changes um, and new laws that were implemented in last year's Medicare physician fee schedule. Um, there were changes made to the Medicare telehealth list. I mean, that's been an area of great change since, you know, 2020 when, um, you know, we had a lot heavier and more flexible use of telehealth. And then, um, you know, we now, now have implemented a more, you know, permanent uh, state of that. Um, changes to policies for opioid use disorder treatment programs and uh, Medicare enrollment changes. There was an expansion of authority um, of CMS so that they can deny or revoke a Medicare uh, provider enrollment based on an OIG exclusion or felony conviction. And all three of those could affect you. Um, so, you know, it's not just looking at, um, you know, what are the specific rules for MFTs and counselors, but what are the rules more broadly in terms of providing services under the Medicare program? Next slide, please. Looking ahead to the 2024 physician fee schedule, um, you know, in addition to the changes we know are coming, there will be a, adjustments to the RVUs, the conversion factor. Um, there may be other things that, imp uh, that impact um, MFTs and, and counselors. Um, and, you know, those days also might be used by other payers. So, I don't want to tip us off, but um, I think we are open to questions. So I'll turn this back over to Jolie. <laughs> yes, thank you so much, um, Gina and Jeannie, for sharing your time and knowledge with us today. You've provided some really vital information to move us several steps closer to January 1st, 2024, when MFTs and counselors will become reimbursed reimbursable Medicare providers. And so we are going to try to entertain at least a couple questions. Um, we don't have a lot of time left and we wanna be really respectful um, of everyone's time, especially the practitioners that are on here that may have clients coming up as well, because I know we have a lot of practitioners. Um, so let's, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go through a couple questions. I'll just read some out. Um, and whichever one of you, I think it's pretty clear which ones will be enrollment questions and then which ones may be um, fee schedule questions. But one question that we have, and I think this will be for Gina, is, is the requirement that you have to, to have completed two years of clinical supervision as part of the licensing process, or do we have to enroll in supervision as a licensed clinician? Hi, this is Alicia. Um, I think we will provide more information on how um, providers are able to meet those supervision requirements and what's required of you. Um, we do plan to issue additional outreach. This is not the first opportunity that we will have um, to provide some communication to you on what's required as far as enrollment. Uh, and we do have a provider enrollment website where we will provide updated information so that we are being clear on what is required for enrollment, including the supervision requirements. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Alicia. I, I appreciate that. Um, let's see if we can, let me see if I can find one about the fee schedule as well. Um, for Jeannie, do you believe that the Medicare physician fee schedule will reflect different payouts for in-person versus telehealth services? That has been in the news recently. I um cannot speak to that. And I actually, I don't think the CMS folks that we have with us are the ones that do the fee schedule. So. Yes. You know, unfortunately, there are a lot of questions that are very hard to answer. And I think as the fee schedule, you know, as we move closer to that and get in that period of making comments, and then it actually is published, 
we'll be answering a lot of these questions. So we'll we'll do our best to answer some of these. I would like to say one more thing too. We're co we're collecting obviously all of these questions, and we are about out of time here. Um, but we will be we we've collected them, and we have a frequently asked questions document on the NBCC website under the Government Affairs page, and we will be. Um, putting answers to questions as we get them. So we'll be updating that um, pretty frequently to try to answer the questions that people have because all of them obviously are not uh, answerable right now. Um, let's see if I can, I think we have time for maybe one more. Let's see if I can find a good one here. We have a lot of supervision questions, so um, just to let CMS know. So it's good that you all are collecting information on that. Um, we do have another one about Medicare Advantage plans. Um, want, people wanting to know if there's a separate application to apply for the separate Medicare Advantage plans. Can you answer that one, Gina? The, 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 the program, the Medicare Advantage would be med, uh, just a health plan contract, just like the ones you already do. Um, it just happens to be that, um, that you know, it's for a Medicare plan and they won't contract with you until you're already in the Medicare fee-for-service. So, so the Medicare fee-for-service enrollment does not get you access except indirectly into Medicare Advantage. Okay. Thank you, Jeannie. I think we have time for this one last question, then we're going to wrap it up. And I, I have had this question quite a bit myself coming into email, and this is, are associate marriage and family therapists eligible to become providers um, under the supervision of an enrolled MFT, licensed MFT? Can Jeannie, you or Gina answer that question? Because we have that from the counseling too, like associate counselors have asked that. I don't believe that the statute provided for associate payment to associate uh, MFTs. Okay, that's yeah, my. I, yeah, I agree. Okay, yeah. good. I, I'm just that's, saying, I, I agree with that. We have to wait until there's further guidance. Okay, thank you. That's my understanding as well. Just wanted to clarify for those that are here in the webinar. Um, Unfortunately, we are out of time, but like I said, we will try to answer some of these questions on our Frequently Asked Questions document on the NBCC website. Um, the Medicare Mental Health Workforce Coalition and NBCC would like to thank our speakers, Gina Mendola and Jeannie Vance, for sharing their knowledge with all the participants and, and to all the participants for attending today's webinar. The link to the session evaluation is posted in the chat, and we will also email it to you following the meeting. To receive continuing education credit, you must complete the evaluation by July 12 at 5 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Certificates will be emailed by July 19th, just to let people know that. Um, we will only be providing credit for the live attendance of this webinar. We hope that you found this session informative and we look forward to seeing you in future webinars. Thank you and we hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.